Hello, everyone. David Alfred Ostrowski here. And in this recording, I'm going to be addressing chat GPT. So I don't have all the answers, but I do have some impressions that I just want to share. If nothing else to save all the time from repeating myself to the endless amount of people that I've been in contact with that have been bringing up this topic. So this might give you some of my impressions and maybe uh, a little bit of insight of how to deal with this or consider this towards your future activity. A little bit about me and the concentration or focus that I have in relationship to chat GBT. I'm a software developer and academic for many years. So that's the position and the primary concern is looking at chat GBT as a means of perhaps even completely replacing what we do as software developers or address this whole issue as academics asking the question, do we take different approaches to our jobs? Are, are our jobs going to be completely eliminated What's the role of chat GBT and other chat mechanisms moving forward? I think it's important, and I'm just gonna draw a few analogies and kind of act as a lawyer in this case to present some of my evidence or information. And ultimately you can make up your own mind. But first and foremost, I think it's important to deal with it and address it because it certainly has been a game changer, at least in the short term and make a plan how to address this and definitely not panic. Okay, I don't think there's anything to panic about. Let's look at history. Now, Chad GBT has been sold or identified as a game changer, right? It's going to change the way we do a lot of things, generating any type of content. Um, and this point on my earlier slide, people who are generating content for Twitter or writing for uh, any type of endeavors have been able to successfully chat, use chat GBT to great effect. So there's no doubt that there can be some efficiencies at the very least, if not completely replacing some of these activities of content generation, at least in part. Let's look at history again. My focus is software development. What do we know from history? The old saying goes, right? We don't learn about history. We are going to be forced to repeat it. So my goal here is to eliminate the panic. And if we have to change the way we do things, let's do that. But let's figure out what we're dealing with and work our way forward. So again, what does history tell us? Let's go back to software development even before my time. So the old timers used to tell me when I started in the business, when they worked with the semi-language programs, those who are not familiar, semi-language is lower generation, um, machine level mnemonics that were used even in the 60s as application development languages. So they moved to programming languages that eventually became developed into languages such as C and Java, C++, C Sharp, and so forth. So we moved to what is known as third generation languages. And this was looked upon as a huge advancement. The people who worked in the summit languages were always revered, revered as godlike, that they would be able to do things that no one even understood. And this movement to higher level programming was a huge improvement and then I'm certain, though I wasn't there at the time actively working, I'm certain at the time that there were concerns of, are we even going to need programmers? Well, what happened? At the end of the day, there was more software, more applications, more code to be written, even in a higher level language of which you need much less code to perform many more tasks. But the trend we have seen from then is that we certainly have 
uh, a lot more work that we've been able to accomplish and that work has inspired even more work to be done. Now there's been concerns along the way with these advancements, advancements such as garbage collection virtual machines. A lot of people point out the fact that these third generation languages did not do a service to our programmers because we're not as efficient. We don't know how to program as well because we don't have the appreciation of the inner workings. This is a theme I want to touch off on and, and make a point of. So that's one thing to be um, um, to take forward and think about is this improvement and most importantly, the knowledge of the inner workings. So let's keep that thought as we move forward. Another point I want to make, the COBOL programming language, for those of you not familiar, COBOL, even today, runs a lot of Fortune 500 companies' code. Most of it has been replaced in the Y2K 20 years ago. There were millions and millions and millions of lines of code, which highly paid programmers were paid to repair in, in light of any uh, Y2K-based disasters with date mechanisms failing. But let's go back to the history of COBOL. This is back again before my professional development time. Not that old, I am old, but not that old. Uh, with COBOL, what I was told by people that there's this brand new language, it is formulated like an English language sentences. It even terminated with a period in the same fashion that we terminate. English sentences or sentences in just about any language or many languages, I should say. The whole premise, the whole selling point of COBOL was that you can come off the streets, no experience at all. I can pick someone, hey, you over there, they can come off the street and they can write programs. But we don't need programmers anymore. We don't have to pay for programmers. What happened since the development of that programmer, that, that uh, technology? More applications were developed. COBOL programmers, came in, they became successful. Eventually, if they didn't improve their skill sets in new languages, their value eroded. Y2K brought that back up. People were making six figure salaries as COBOL developers in the Y2K um, um, concern. And back 20 years ago, that was a lot more money than it is today. So, uh, so that points out to the fact that it didn't replace people. It was sold as a replacement of programmers, it created, what's the theme we're going with here? It created more attention. It created more inspiration for new applications. This was in the 70s, okay. Uh, in the 80s, when I started my career, the late 80s, very late, I should say, third generation, fourth generation even, that's mislabeled, your sequel, uh, started to become very popularized. And these, they call them 4GLs at the time, that with these query languages and scripting languages, we can accomplish yet even more efficiency with code. And no one wasn't sold as replacing developers. This was definitely a huge efficiency improvement. And it was the technology of the day created a lot of excitement. It was very popular. What was the end result? Did we eliminate programmers? Did we cut back on staff? Did people lose their jobs because of the DOM of SQL? Well, the opposite happened. More applications were developed. More reliance on data to be applied in the business. We've seen other trends since throughout the um, starting in the 80s, going through the 90s and 2000s, and even 2010s. This includes ERP packages, Bon and SAP. These were entire packages that should do the work of a department, human resources, Oracle Financials, SAP, human resources. We don't need developers to develop systems for this. We have an entire package that uh, accomplishes this. And the idea was entire staff, could be replaced. What happened? It didn't occur. Ultimately, the people who are experts in these packages were paid $300 an hour, very exorbitant salaries, especially for the time. Mind you, this was over 20 years ago because they found out that these packages were not a one size fit all. 
and they had to be extensively configured or modified to fit the business of an operation, contrary to how they were sold to IT executives, which they would confess to at a later point in time. These were sold as efficiency improvements, remember, going back to history in the 90s. These were sold to sell, eliminate everyone's job. Entire departments were going to be replaced. You don't have to develop your own internal package to do these operations. That didn't happen. Outsourcing was sold on a similar nature as well. All these software activities are going to go to other countries. People are dropping classes, dropping out of programs because they were concerned just not any software, as well as the prevailing attitude that everything that has been written has been developed already. We already have word processors. We already have databases. We don't need new databases. We don't need a new word processor. I have Word. I have Microsoft Office. I had it back then, 20, 30 years ago. No purpose for, no reason for improvement. What happened? The contrary happened. We found yet even new types of applications to work on, new things to do, more efficiencies, more things got automated. Frameworks, Ruby on Rails, WordPress, both game changers of their time and even existing and today, primarily selling point. Anyone can step in and generate an entire application a fraction of the time. This was sold as an efficiency improvement, not necessarily to replace someone's job, but to substantially reduce the amount of effort that you would put into your job, right, as a developer. What do we find out with these frameworks? My personal experience. For generic solutions, when I do a cookbook application, I can press a button and I can generate something with Ruby on Rails. However, to change it, one thing, and I'm going back to the assembly language example analogy, that I had to have intimate knowledge of exactly how it worked to be able to change that. And if I didn't, if I'd have that experience, I was really in a lot of hurt. Same thing with WordPress. The old adage was simple things are ridiculously simple and less than simple things are impossibly complicated. Okay, and that is, uh, no better example than WordPress, which is object-oriented to the death. If you go deep down in the internals and try to change something and do a completely custom uh, mechanisms. Though I haven't worked extensively with Wix, I would assume that similar templating frameworks and automated site generation works in the same fashion. If you're going to do a very generic site with basic functionality, if you want to mirror a uh, functionality of another site, you're all set. However, you want to do something completely unique that's going to give you a completely unique business competitive advantage may not be appropriate. Uh, and you definitely have to have an intimate knowledge to be able to accomplish those tasks. Towards program efficiency, what has been a couple of the biggest tools to help developers? Google, just Google itself to be able to look up potential problems and solutions also coupled with Stack Overflow, which has supported a knowledge base of contributed to examples that can greatly efficiently improve your efficiency. Has this replaced, I got to ask the hard question to replace programmers. We don't need any programmers anymore. Or can one programmer do the work of three? Well, not quite, right? At the end of the day, we have all been doing more things and we've been doing them faster. I can go on and on with the examples. Machine learning APIs is another that I don't have listed. We may not be spending time writing, rewriting machine learning algorithms, but we've been doing 10 times the amount of work with machine learning and analytics than we did even 10 years ago. What's the trend? The trend is more and more and more. So it's something to consider as we move forward with the ideas. One important point here, who benefits, okay, from all of this? Um, we may be at the worst case scenario. And again, I don't have all the answers, right? These are my thoughts, my impressions. The term that comes to mind here that's most appropriate is that of knowledge workers. Um, the hard question to ask here is P 
people who test chat GBT, including myself, put in the specification for a solution, how do you find the detailed solution? Well, you have to have in your mind exactly what you wanted to accomplish. I don't think a non-developer can do that. So I think that intimate knowledge and expressing your problem is only comes with hands-on development software skill. So I don't see this pointing to the replacement of that knowledge. One analogy is that of social media. Who benefits the most, the user or the companies who sell the information? We all know what social media was sold to us as being this free service that's incredible. I can do so many things. I can communicate with people. And many people have used it to incredible positive benefit. It's also benefited companies, right? Companies sell that information behind the scenes. The old adage here is that when there's no product, you become the product. If you're using chat GDP, if you're using Facebook, Twitter, or anything similar, LinkedIn, are you using the product? Are you the, or are you the product? I don't have a perfect answer for that. In some cases, it works both ways. Some people get more out of it than they put in, and some people might, I'm suggesting, and I know for a fact this occurs in social media, that you are giving more to it than is giving back to you in net benefit, right? So here's the hard question, the soul searching we need to ask ourselves in whatever capacity that you're going to use, chat, GBT, or related technology, who's benefits the most from this? You or the person that you are supplying information? Let me rephrase this concept. If you are being solicited by OpenAI to give them all the information of what you're thinking about, what types of problems you're going to solve, fill out a knowledge base, populate that for them, would you be interested in doing that, right? Uh, but yet you are doing that in some respect and in return, they may be solving your problem. But we cannot discount the fact that they are obtaining a lot of information to our corrections through the transfer of knowledge. Okay, if I'm engaging with chat GBT and it comes back with something that's not technically accurate, which I have found, I correct chat GBT. Who benefited from that minute of information, me or chat GBT? At that point, they won. There's other cases I may be completely off base. I present the information, my experiences, my impression, you make the decision, let's move forward. The hard question again, do we still have to know how to code? I think so, I think we do. I think it's important to my earlier examples, what has been the trend? More work and less people to do it, right? So, what ChatGPT is doing is a reflection of the internet. It's a reflection of the existing knowledge. The knowledge doesn't come out of anywhere, right? So any program that identifies code is a function of searching. And to that point, ChatGPT may be doing it better than any search engine has ever done it. That is, may not be anyone that can completely deny that. And I certainly won't uh, deny that. But let's look at the exact needs of the industry and where's the money going? Where's the investment? What's the biggest cost in software development life cycle? By most common metrics, the most popular software engineering uh, metrics that exist is ballpark 80%, okay? And that is in maintenance. So can chat GPT effectively do that or will it be able to do that in the future? I can't answer completely for the future. All I know is what the trends are. There's been a lot of um, decades and decades of promises that developers won't be needed, but that hasn't worked out in that fashion. And a lot of these issues can boil down to theoretical computer science and problems of decidability and just how complicated proving software correctness is, okay, uh, which is perhaps even a more deeper conversation than what I plan to do here. But it's something 
to consider as we move forward. So maybe our jobs will change ever so slightly. Did they change with Stack Overflow? I know with Stack Overflow and Google Combined, I've been a better developer. I've been able to develop faster, but it hasn't replaced my job and it hasn't replaced the necessity of me, most importantly, understanding how that code was generated because the maintenance is what kills you as a developer. If you become a competent developer, you can crank out code very quickly, right? You can be on top of your game and generate code, hit 10x, whatever. But when it breaks, who is going to fix the code? Can ChatGBT do it? It can help you. It may accelerate. Will it replace you? I don't think so. No. I present my case. You make your own mind. Let's proceed. A story, if you haven't heard it before, Henry Ford, the first who founded Ford Motor Company, may be legendary. Story may not even be true. There was a story about Henry Ford. He had a generator, one of his initial plants. It broke down. He called someone to fix it. Now, mind you, this was over 100 years ago. Okay. The gentleman fixed his generator. And he charged $1,000, which was a ridiculous amount of money for the, the day and time. Henry Ford, being a very um, astute businessman, challenged the bill. So why are you charging me? You only connected. You connected two wires. So he adjusted the bill. He adjusted the bill $10 to connect the two wires, but $990 to know which two wires to attach. How many times are we paid as developers, valued as software developers, because we know which two wires to attach. So we know when something's broke, how to fix it. We have that developed programmer's intuition from years of experience. And while our jobs may be accelerated by any tool, whether it be a framework, whether it be Google, Stack Overflow, or any other mechanism, ChatGPT for that matter, we still need that underlying knowledge and that's how we are valued. We call us a knowledge worker. Maybe you don't wanna call us a developer anymore. You call it whatever you want, but the demand is still there. And the trend is increasingly more application of software and just bringing more attention to the business, just like all these other examples have. Another story. There was a childhood story and you look on the internet, I can't, can't even find the exact story to my memory. There was a homework story about a homework machine. There are several stories, childhood stories about this. The one that I recall reading was this about junior high students that were so obsessed with building a computer program because they didn't want to do their homework. So they spent more time learning to do their homework so they could automate a task with, the, with this computer. The irony of the story was they actually spent more time learning their homework to automate the task that they actually had to learn how it was these math problems and everything were accomplished to program the machine to do it automatically for them. So they tricked themselves to actually doing more work than they needed. Now, this isn't a perfect analogy, but I wonder in some cases, and to my experience with chat GPT, is, are there some similarities? I don't know you can answer that. I am not giving you the answer. I'm not sure. But I do know one thing, if you do not establish a dialogue with ChatGPT, it will not guess and give you a turnkey system and read your mind. The people I know that get the most out of ChatGPT are expert developers. And they could probably crank out the code just as fast as it would take for a session with ChatGPT or pretty close to it. And this begs the question, if ChatGPT did read your mind, why are there tutorials on the internet to support you using ChatGPT if it's so intuitive 
It should be just as natural as talking to your friend, okay? And in some cases, it may be. Again, I am not for or against ChatGPT, and I'm not using this as a means to take a negative or positive position. That's for you to decide. I'm just putting it in context to my own personal experience of what I've learned over the years. I've heard the term plagiarism machine defined for chat GPT. That would have negative connotation and I don't really subscribe to that. Um, however, it can make you think when you look at both sides of the positions. Is this the homework machine of 2023? Can we be so enthralled with the possibility of a machine tricking us as a Turing machine um, test? Turing test suggests that it has somehow some inherent recognition of the world as opposed to just being an elaborate knowledge base with a very 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 slick presentation which it does and it does very impressive things i would add however i have seen content generation programs written in python that are 20 years old that have also done very impressive things as well and i've also worked with natural language based um, internal knowledge uh, bases back in the 90s that showed similar pro uh, promise if they would have been developed over the last 30 years or so. So I don't have the answers. I'm presenting the information. You make up your final decision. But I don't think it's cause for panic in any case. Some final points here. Chad GBT risk is the risk. I think there is. I think there is a little bit of risk. I think you have to ask yourself the hard question, and it depends on who you are, what content you're dealing with, and who's using that content and who's paying for it. Who learns the most? You or ChatGBT? When I used it, I corrected it more than it corrected than it helped me. Who got the better end of the deal? I don't know. Maybe a draw. Uh, who benefits? I can't answer that. Okay, it all matters who you are. I am certain that people are going to benefit. But I think it's important to put it all in the context and do not panic, okay? I see a community, uh, if it is a community here, or I see a community behind this, if it is a community, uh, does it exist as such? Or is this just a company that's gonna sell that information behind the scenes or is it both? I see with Stack Overflow, I see community. I contribute to Stack Overflow and I get a recognition out of that. So there's a mutual benefit. In that case, I would argue the point that maybe with some of these earlier content systems, looking at GPT as a content system, maybe I benefit a little bit more with Stack Overflow. Again, it would depend on who you are. But I do want to point out the fact, at least with Stack Overflow, you get some type of recognition for the contributions. I don't know if this is, exists in chat GBT or the future direction. It may be, maybe a suggestion to open AI, okay, in which case they benefited from this presentation if anyone from there happens to read it. Another final point, TBL. Tim Berners-Lee, if you're not aware, this is the originator of the internet. Back in the 1990s, his vision of next generation internet was the semantic web. Computers talk to computers. This actually suggests that browsers should be antiquated. Browsers should have been antiquated 10, 20 years ago. They're so 1990, really. So anything we use a browser for, whether it's chat GBT can't be viewed as cutting edge if we're going to be completely transparent and honest with ourselves. Everyone, it's 2023, okay? I grew up in the 70s. We watched science fiction movies that took place in this year or in this decade. We were supposed to be flying to Mars. We we're supposed to have backpacks, rocket packs, flying cars. And what are we doing? We're sending tweets to each other and we're taking pictures of our food and mailing it to people. That's pathetic, okay. By Mr. Tim Berners-Lee, one of the last greatest perhaps computer scientists 
of our generation. We got a lot of work to do. If Chad GDT is the way to get there, bring it. Bring it and I hope it gets better because we have a lot of unfulfilled work among that being implementing the semantic web of which everything should be done. I shouldn't be searching on the internet for anything. My program should find solutions to some of their bugs. My car should fix itself. My home should schedule repairs, smart homes, smart cities. I can go on and on, do a whole presentation on it. So we need to be doing even more work with software. What is past, what is my, the history presented here? The history presented here tells us that we have, we continually with these advancements, we find ins inspiration to be even doing more things. So by this vision, Chad GBT should be replaced by programs that anticipate our needs and engage with other computers as browsers. They just don't fit in that vision. It's so 1990s, guys. Okay, so to think that this is a disruptor, if this is a disruptor, then we're pretty pathetic, really. So just something to put things in the context. I don't see it as being the disruptor. Is it a good thing? Is it impressive? It most definitely is. I was impressed with some of the things that it was able to do. Um, but I don't see it replacing us as a lot of computers from science fiction movies. Okay, we need to put it in context and not panic. Concluding points. And I have an image here of an old cartoon character from the 70s, my childhood. His name was George Jetson. You may be able to find him somewhere on the internet or some type of reruns, probably run in perpetuity. George Jetson was a comic book or cartoon character who lived in the future. He had a flying car. He had a robot made. He had a job, he just pressed one button. As you see in the animation, I put chat GPT. So it's chat GPT, my new job where I just press a button and my job is done for him. Did George Jetson really need to know how to do his job? I think he did. We're being realistic. When that computer broke down, he had to know how to fix it. He had to have some kind of knowledge. So is chat GPT quantum leap in technology? I don't think so. Is it an improvement? It definitely is. Can't deny it. Wouldn't even attempt to. I think it's slightly better though. It's 5% better. It's gonna get us there faster. I sure hope so. I hope it's an improvement because we need a lot of help to accomplish our potential that we've never reached as a society. Call us whatever you want moving forward. A knowledge worker, computers, instead of a data scientist, computer scientist, software developer, on and on and on. At the end of the day, you still have to know how, to do, how the software works. I don't see that replacing academics. Still need the inner workings. Who gains the most? I can't answer that. I guess it all depends on who you are and what you are trying to do. If you're generating tweets, maybe you benefit the most. If you're writing software for a nuclear facility, I think you better do a lot of dust checking and know exactly what you're doing because unlike George Jetson, when things break down, you better be able to figure it out in a hurry. So those are my thoughts, not yours. Make up your own mind. I've given you my impressions. Do with it what you will. Thanks for listening. Have a great day. Take care. Talk to everybody soon. Thank you.